Space-time is just our headset, but we lose ourselves in the game. And we, we lose, uh, we, we take the game as, as the reality. For Essentia Foundation, I had the honor of sitting down with one of my absolute intellectual heroes, cognitive psychologist Donald Hoffman, to discuss the nature of reality. Before I share our full conversation, here are some of the highlights. I'll say this, there is no physicalist theory that has at any time proposed a specific conscious experience that they can explain. There's not one on the table. The distinction that we make between conscious and unconscious and between living and non-living is not a principal distinction. It's a mistake. It's, it's, it's a rookie mistake that, that we make by mistaking our space-time headset for the final truth. What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? Were you happy with the movie The Matrix, what it did sort of culturally with that metaphor? The, the Matrix really does open people's minds up to the possibility that what they're experiencing is just a simulation, right? Now, in, in The Matrix, though, once you pop out of the simulation, it's, it's, it's another space-time world. So when Neo takes off the headset, um, he's back in the space-time world. Welcome to the real world. So is Trinity and everybody, they're all, they're all in the space-time world. So, so this, what I'm saying is even more radical, that, that whatever is beyond space-time is utterly unlike space and time. But this is, this is like fundamental stuff, right? This is the real cool stuff. We are still thinking of traveling in space-time and we have all these space-time fantasies, right? And most of the galaxies that we can see, we could never go to. Space is expanding so quickly that we could never get to them through space, moving at the speed of light. So there's all this real estate out there that we can see that's waving at us and saying, nanny, nanny, you can never get here. Well, that's if you go through space-time. But if space-time is just a headset, think about the options that come. You don't have to go through space-time. You could go around space-time. When we let go of the physicalist framework, we say, no, I am consciousness. I transcend this. Death is just stepping out of this headset. In other words, we're wired up to take the headset seriously. And, and so consciousness sort of wired itself up to take the headset seriously. But part of the waking up process is to step back and go, oh, wow, OK. Oh, no, 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 I'm not a little thing inside the headset. The headset is inside of me. I, I, I'm eventually going to take the headset off. So I can have a looser relationship with all this stuff. I don't need to get that big house to, to be something. I don't need to have that big scientific paper. I don't need to be acknowledged. I, I, Has it done this for you, Donald? Has it done this for you, what you're now saying? Yeah, sort of this realization in your personal life? It, it's interesting. It, it does it for me when I am conscious. Okay, great. Donald, I'm really, really happy that we uh, can do this. So um, nice to have you on the other side. Uh, sitting here. Thank you very much, Hans, and it's very kind of you to invite me. Uh, yeah, we just spoke about your background. I thought if it's okay with you to start a bit sort of on a personal note, personal note um, could you tell a little bit about your background and your upbringing? Well, I was born in an army hospital in San Antonio, Texas. My, my dad was a GI. Uh, he was just trying to find himself, so he went into the army, newlywed, uh, and I was born nine months later. <laughs> So they, they were both just like 21 and uh, trying to f figure things out. And they, they were having a hard time making ends meet. They didn't have enough money to eat at the end of the month. So it was quite, quite something. But uh, six months after I was born, they moved to California. So I, I basically was, was raised in Southern California all of my life. And he was, he was an engineer. And my mom was, uh, she had a bachelor's in biology. And uh, she ended up doing some computer programming when I was about 10 years old. She was one of the early programmers and sort of got me interested in computers. My dad was an engineer. Uh, his, he had a master's in chemistry and uh, worked at various um, high-tech companies you know, that were at the early stages of building like um, storage devices for computers and so forth. Um, and then he, uh, he 
became a, a Christian when I was 10 or 11 years old, and that changed things quite a bit. They, um, my, my parents both jumped into it pretty heavily, and um, by the time I was in my mid to late teens, um, he was an associate pastor um, at, at, at a church and went on for, for decades afterwards to be a pastor. So I was really, from about age 10 on, really raised pretty heavily in a fundamentalist um, Christian Protestant kind of background. So, and that, so it was pretty intense and, and of course, you, well in my case, I was the oldest. Um, I didn't rebel. I, I went, went along. It, it took me a long time to get a perspective, to be able to step back and start to get a perspective on it. My, my younger brother um, rebelled earlier and uh, my, my sister has never rebelled <laughs> to, to this day. And did you ever personally believe um, uh, that you have the faith as well as a teenager? Well, yeah, I believed in believed in God, and um, and you know my my thoughts about that have have changed over the years with what that word actually means. But there is a sense in which I still think that consciousness is fundamental, um, and you know the, the the grandfather in a chair with a long white beard is not what I think of when I think of consciousness. Um, so so you know the my so I had a it had a big influence on me, um, both positive and negative. I mean it it really made me think about things beyond space and time. But I think it made me think about them in, in not very functional ways. And, and so I had to step back and, and really sort out what, what, what were, I mean, there are beautiful things. Uh, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, that's, I mean, that's, that's, there's many, many beautiful things, but it's a mixed bag. And so we each have to, to sort out um, that mixed bag and, and take what is, is really good and, and um, and try to be kind to everybody in the process. Uh, but I think it's so great that your work offers, is, is in a sense, I think, a refuge. I mean, that that it is to me, uh, alongside with uh, people like Bernardo and, and, and more people who think consciousness might be fundamental. So that I think that's really great that you're offering that intellectually uh, through science to people. And uh, a question I had has to do with... Um, the, uh, I hear you say a lot in interviews that you want to make things mathematically rigorous, right? And I am not a, not a ma mathematician. Uh, my understanding of math does not sort of extend uh, beyond uh, uh, high school. And um, what exactly, if you had to define, and that's maybe a too a weird or broad question, but what is math exactly? Is it sort of a symbolic representation of reality? I mean, that's what I now think, but how would you define mathematics? So mathematics is a way of getting rid of um, fuzzy thinking <laughs> and w hand waving and, and therefore the dogmatism that can come with it because I know what's right. Um, because and if you try to come at me with some argument, then I'll just sort of change my view enough so that, so if, but if I put it down in an equation, then uh, it's hard for me to dodge and weave. It's not impossible, but it makes it much, much harder to, to dodge and weave. So, so mathematics um, is, infinitely complicated. This is a Girdle, Kurt Girdle in 1930, 1931, when he was a young man, like 25 years old, proved perhaps one of the, the greatest intellectual achievements in all of human history. It was called Girdle's Incompleteness Theorem. And without going into the details, it, it, it entails that there's no end to the exploration of mathematical structure. There, in some sense, it, it seems to me that it, it entails that you can't be omniscient about mathematics because it, it just really it, it, we'll, we'll put it this way, the kind of omniscience involved would be stunning omniscience. Uh, I, it would have to, I would have to, it's beyond my conception of the kind of omniscience that would be needed to have a full comprehension of the math. Certainly any finite formal system is, Kirtle, Girdle shows us, merely a scratch on the surface of this infinite depth of mathematics. Um, and, and so that that means that math is a two-edged sword here. On the one hand, it cuts through our dogmatism and our fuzzy thinking. And so it's absolutely essential. Because one thing we know about human nature is that you know, we, we, uh, we're dogmatic. We, we know what we know, and we know that the other guy's wrong. And, and uh, we're not in, in conversations typically to, to learn. We're in, co in conversations to show other people that we're right and they're wrong, um, with, with happy exceptions. But with mathematics, um, 
when you're forced to state your ideas with mathematical precision, there's no hiding, right? And when I say, for example, that I think that consciousness is fundamental, and then I say, and here's what I claim the structure of consciousness is. And so I have to write, I write down some math. Now, now I get the other, so that's the first side of the sword, and it's wonderful, right? It really cuts through dogmatism and fuzzy thinking and, and dodging and weaving. On the other hand, Gödel has told us that essentially there's infinite wisdom beyond any formal theory that you could write down. Yeah, by proven by math itself, that's so astonishing. It's proven by mathematics. That's, that's really, truly stunning that, that the mathematics itself gives us the insight that no mathematics that we could do is ever the whole truth. And in fact, that there's essentially unbounded intelligence of mathematics beyond what you could do with what, so, and, and, and who knows, I mean, if, and mathematics isn't the whole world, so, but that's just part of it, certainly part of, the, of, of reality. And so already we know that reality um, transcends any mathematical theory. So that, that also entails that there can be no scientific theory of everything. And yeah, yeah, it makes us humble, right? Gödel, Gödel made us humble. It's, it's, it's very, very humbling. And so what, what we have then, so someone might say, well, just throw up your hands, you know, let's just party and, and, and you know, we, we can't, can't know it all, then why know anything? And, and I think that that's the wrong attitude. It's not my attitude anyway. It, it, it is, um, we do have this wonderful tool and we do find that it is incredibly um, effective. Uh, Eugene Wigner said of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in, in the natural sciences. He's, he was amazed at it and a lot of us agree. It's truly stunning that uh, using Newton and Newton's equations we can send rockets to planets and it works quite well. And with Einstein's equations we get even uh, you know greater fidelity and with quantum theory you know uh, well, Maxwell's equations in quantum theory, we're, we're talking uh, literally on opposite sides of the world using technology that would not be possible without the mathematics. Absolutely not. Um, and and so, so the mathematics is at, at once empowering and it avoids dogmatism and it really then is humbling. Once, once you really understand it, it's truly humbling. And, and so, and I think for me, it then is a pointer to a way of thinking about what is consciousness about. If consciousness is all there is, then mathematical structure is only about consciousness because that's all it's there for it to be about. So, so it, then Gödel is telling us that there's no end to the variety of conscious experiences and conscious activity. Wh whatever consciousness is, is literally unbounded because mathematics is unbounded. Yeah, I'd love to go a bit d deeper into that, but I'd first like to ask you, you just said, I mean, it avoids, mathematics avoids fuzzy thinking, right? And we, um, I'd like to talk a bit about sort of the, the two paradigms, phys uh, uh, physicalism versus idealism. It's a big spectrum, of course, there's a lot in between, but could you sort of sketch our Newtonian worldview and how we always thought about uh, consciousness and why that felt so um, um, scientific or scientifically correct and and what quantum theory did to that notion right so so many of the early scientists like like Newton himself were were actually believers in God and 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 Christians and and Newton apparently wrote more theology than than physics um, but his his the Newtonian world was essentially a mechanical world. You could write down these uh, differential equations and if you knew the starting conditions with precision, then you could predict pretty much everything that was going to happen um, going forward. And, and so it led others like uh, George Barclay to, you know, who was a, a bishop in the, in the Christian you know, uh, Church of England or something like that, um, to come up with his version of idealism as sort of a counter to what he viewed was the, the mechanism, the mechanical view of the universe that came from Newton. Um, so he, he it was a reaction in part against that. Um, and, but eventually, uh, you know, idealism had a heyday in the 1800s, um, but in the 1900s it, it sort of died out. Um, largely died out, the success of Newton and the, then the success of, of, of Einstein's special and general relativity 
theories. Um, and then the success of quantum mechanics. Now, with, with quantum mechanics, the early theorists, many of them, like Max Planck, for example, um, um, clearly thought that space and time were not the, fun, not the final thing. They, they thought, you know, Max Planck was very, very clear. He thought consciousness was fundamental, and he, he, he said so. Um, and, and there was a period in which many of the early thinkers in quantum theory, you know, from like 1926, 1925, until World War II, so that, that period in there, uh, there was a lot of soul searching about what was quantum mechanics telling us deeply about who we are and the nature of the universe and, and is the physicalist idea that space and time and matter are fundamental. So those, I mean, that's the, that's the physicalist idea. Space time is fundamental and the particles in space time, you know, quarks, uh, leptons and bosons, those are our new fundamental particles right now. That, that is the fundamental grounding reality and everything else is just a complicated pattern of the interactions of, of those particles in space-time. Many quantum theorists begin to question that early on, but after the start of World War II, things changed. Um, it, it, we got the shut up and calculate kind of attitude because physics now, you know, and quantum physics, um, became put in service of, of the war um, and, and it became highly funded and it made the atom bomb and, and all of a sudden it was a completely different thing. And, and so that, the, the early generation that started, that were thinking, what does this really mean? That, that really got shut down in large part by World War II. Um, but, but more recently then, it, you know, like the conference that uh, we'll be having here at Chapman, um, uh, it, there's been a lot of thought now about the nature of what our current physics theories are telling. Quantum field theory now um, with gravity, you know, trying to understand how those interact um, has, has led some, but not too many, um, physicists to, to once again wonder whether consciousness is fundamental. That, that I would say, not, I don't know too many physicists. Um, um, I've been to an FQXI conference a few years ago on the role of the observer in, in, in quantum theory, and uh, it, it became very, very clear there that um, the idea that consciousness might be fundamental was, was basically not on the table. It, 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 it's, it's not taken seriously. But what is taken seriously is that space-time is doomed. That's really interesting, you know, and we're, we're talking big, big giants in, in physics. Ed Witten has said that, who, um, one of the ones who's been foundational in string theory, M theory. Um, Nathan Seiberg at the Institute for Advanced Study, and then uh, very influentially, uh, Nima Arkani Hamed, who's also at the Institute for Advanced Study. And, and it's, it's become very, very clear from the actual structure of the physical laws themselves that space-time cannot be fundamental. And this is, again, where the mathematics is really powerful. Just like Gödel used the mathematics to show that mathematics, at least any finite axiomatization of mathematics, can't be the whole thing. So the physicists are using the theory of space-time to show that space-time can't be the whole thing. And that is the beauty of the mathematics. It tells you where the theories stop. This is where space, space time is great. It's a wonderful framework for a while. And here is where it stops. It stops at about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It ceases to have any operational meaning. And what happens, but you're referring to the Planck scale, right? The smallest scale that we have in physics, what exactly happens at that, at that skill that makes you say space-time is doomed? So, of course, I'm not a physicist, so I'm, I'm telling you what the physicists say. Um, but but the, what the physicists will tell you is that <clears throat> the way that you probe smaller and smaller regions of space, you know, in other words, to have a better and better microscope to look at smaller and smaller details, you need to have um, wavelengths of light that are getting finer and finer because you have to have fine wavelengths of light to resolve fine detail in what you're looking at. Well, that's fine. It requires more energy. Um, 
From quantum theory, we understand that the energy is proportional to the frequency, E equals h nu. So as the frequency goes up, you need more energy. So that's fine. Um, so b unless there's gravity, and that's the problem. So with qu if it was just quantum mechanics, you could, in principle, go, go as far as you wanted, as much energy as you wanted. But the problem is, is with gravity and Einstein, energy and mass are equivalent. So as you put more and more energy into a smaller and smaller region of space, you're essentially putting more mass into a small region of space. And then, unfortunately, you, at some point, at around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, you just start creating black holes. Um, and so, so the very thing that you're trying to study no longer exists. And if you put more energy, if you say, I'm frustrated, I'm just going to try to go smaller with higher and higher frequencies, <coughs> you just make the black hole bigger. So the, the, problem, just, the, pro the problem literally grows. <laughs> so th that's one reason. The, the second reason is that in quantum theory, the measuring devices themselves, the thing that you're using to measure the spin of the electron or the, you know, the, the position of, the, of a gluon or something like that, these devices themselves are physical devices, and so they're quantum mechanical systems with their own degrees of freedom. And, and therefore, they, they have their own limits of precision, Heisenberg uncertainty kinds of things. And so if you want more and more precise measurements, you have to have more and more degrees of freedom in those measuring devices, which is going to make them heavier and heavier. And at some point, once again, the device will collapse into a black hole. So if you have a small, if you have a room and you're trying to measure something in a room, it turns out there is nothing that you can measure with precision. So there are no local observables in any part of space and time. Yeah, so if you want to pinpoint space-time down to the smallest and really know what it is at the smallest level, it blow, will blow in your face. It will become a black hole. And that, That's right. And, and beyond that, then the very notion of space and time, of lengths and distances and, and time, beyond th that level simply has no operational meaning. So we're not, they're not saying that there are pixels, that, that, that at the bottom level there are these pixels, like the pixels on your screen, of your computer screen, or something like that. No, it just means that the whole notion of space-time itself ceases to make sense. <laughs> so, it, it, so it stops. Space-time is doomed. It cannot. So this is a huge blow, because with Newton, right, space-time is fundamental. Although Newton believed it was more a dualist view because he thought that there was a God beyond space-time. But once, once the scientific world let go of that, then it's just space-time and its particles are fundamental. And we thought, we thought that it was infinitely deep. You know, you could always, we thought reductionism was going to work. We could just go to smaller and smaller scales in space-time to find more and more fundamental laws. And so, and with, with you know, Boltzmann and his work on uh, thermodynamics and so forth, we, we, we had our first taste that maybe something like that could really work, that we could, uh, well, not the first taste, but a, a compelling taste that uh, that kind of reductionist thing could really work. And so we were off to the races with, uh, Reductionism. Yeah, so reductionism would be, yeah, reductionism is, so I understand this, but this is just for people watching this. Reductionism means going down into space time, the smallest uh, building blocks of space time, and see if we can understand that. And if we understand that, we, then we have laws that sort of govern everything bigger, uh, including consciousness. That's right. So it, it's going to be as we go to smaller and smaller scales, we'll just find deeper and deeper laws. And so that was that was the the dream, and um, it's it's a and a Newtonian but, dream. but Donald, what um, I'm very curious about your take on quantum mechanics, or at least how you would explain it. I've read this book, um, uh, Quantum Enigma, by Bruce Rosenblum and Fred Kuttner. I, I I heard it was sort of a good introductionary book, and I found it very, very, um, um, very good. And they say with quantum theory physics encountered consciousness and i was just wondering i've read the book and i still find it hard to sort of retell it to people because it's just so counterintuitive how would you explain that that in quantum theory or or i mean if you agree did physics encounter consciousness well uh, some of the earlier pioneers of quantum theory did think that so max planck i think Schrodinger, arguably, um, Wigner. Um, some things that are von Neumann wrote, wrote seem along those lines, although I won't pin him with that. But I would say, when I talk to modern-day quantum physicists, um, 
I don't, when, when they talk about the role of the observer in quantum theory, the observer is a technical term. It's some kind of measuring device, perhaps another quantum system, another physical system. Uh, and the idea that, that consciousness is fundamental um, is a, a tiny minority view. If it, you know, I would say under 1% in, in, in my um, inter interactions. They, they understand that, that in, in many of the interpretations of quantum theory that we need to have some notion of the role of the observer Although the, in, the, in the many worlds or multiverse kinds of interpretations, you can start to to let go of that role of the observer in some sense, and but they have their own problems. Um, so, so I would say that for those who um, want to ignore consciousness and still be quantum theorists, they can do that, <laughs> and and many many brilliant um, physicists are, are doing. Just that. Even the ones who um, take the notion of agency as really important in quantum theory, that somehow the, the wave function is not you know, you know, the, a state of the external world independent of the agent, but is actually a statement of the degrees of belief of the agent about the outcomes that they will experience if they do certain experiments, certain measurements. But even in that case, um, and, and the, the theorists doing this are, are, are brilliant, most of them are, are going to say, um, I don't know what an agent is, and I'm not going to commit that it's consciousness. I'm just talking about, you know, I'm doing quantum theory, you, you, you tell me what an agent is. But it's got, probably going to be some kind of, when we really cash it out, it's probably going to you know, be some kind of quantum physical system with just lots of degrees and freedom and, and, and so forth. But uh, don't, don't worry with me about that right now. I, I, you know, I, I'm just going to assume that there's some notion of agent that I'll leave undefined. So I don't see, wh what I do see is brilliant researchers like Nimar Khani Hamed and Juan Maldacena making bold moves beyond space time. They're, they're saying there is, you know, space time is doomed. Um, it's the work of our generation to find out what's beyond space time. So how do you do that? Well, you know, what, what, what kind of flashlight are you going to use into the dark beyond space time? Because even though quantum field theory and gravity together tell us that space time isn't fundamental, they can't tell us what's beyond. Right? <laughs> they, they, they just say, oh, this is how far I go and no further, but they can't tell you what, what's next. But when you say but, but but when you say you think consciousness is fundamental, you are not in the school of, and indeed you're right, that is a minority, I think, the consciousness causes collapse sort of interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, von Neumann, um, who still sort of believed that, and John Wheeler, I don't really know. I'm curious also on your thoughts on John Wheeler. But um, so you are not thinking that consciousness somehow collapses a uh, world in superposition into a classical world. Uh, yeah, no, that's not not my view. Um, I, I I think that the closest to my view among the standard quantum interpretations is um, uh, Chris Fuchs qu uh, cubism, quantum Bayesianism. Yeah. Right. So we're, and I think it's. A brilliant interpretation where, where Chris Fuchs says, look, the, 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 the wave function is not some objective thing out in space and time. It's in the mind of the agent. It's the degrees of belief of the agent. And, and he's, he's very consistent in, in pointing out that when you're thinking about probabilities, you can either be an ob objective probabilist or a, or a Bayesian subjectivist. And, and he gives good reasons to think that, uh, you know, just on probability alone, you should be thinking about a subjectivist interpretation of probability. And then uh, once you adopt that, then, well, the quantum wave function is really um, how probabilities of interpretation. Just for people who've now totally lost it, uh, um, when, we t when we talk about um, objective probabilities, then you, um, then you believe there is an actual world out there and you just don't know it, right? And then you have to deal with these probabilities, and 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 that 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 gives you sort of uh, a way to predict what's going to happen, right? But there is an obje objective world, and subjective probabilities would be that you just don't know what's out there, or or how would you describe this?
Well, you, you could be a, a realist about the external world and be a subjectivist about the probabilities. So, you could, so, so the objectivism and subjective, subjectivism about probability is about um, what do we mean when we say the probability of tails is half? Well, does it mean that if I flip the coin a thousand times, you'll get exactly 500 heads and 500 tails? That's a sort of a frequentist kind of view that, that what probability means is what frequency, if you do lots of observations, will you end up with? Uh, and the subjectivist says, well, no, it's not about objective frequencies that are measured. It's, it's more about your degrees of belief about what you, know, what you expect to have happen. And, and so you could have prior probabilities. You know, I, I expect the sun to rise tomorrow at uh, whatever time, 5.30 in the morning. Um, because it's been doing so for thousands of years. And, and so I have this prior. I mean, I, it's, it's not, you know, I would say it's 0.9999999, you know, all, you know, a lot of nines that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. But there is a, a tiny chance. Um, so, and that's, um, that's a subjective degree of belief. And so, so now if, if you have this idea that, that what we're dealing with in quantum theory and when we're talking about the wave functions of various, you know, like two gluons hitting each other and four gluons spraying out, in, like in the Large Hadron Collider. And you're asking, what are the probabilities of these various events? <coughs> and, you, and you write down these scattering amplitudes, you know, these amplitudes for it. I think the cubist would say, that is merely me as a theorist, putting, as a good Bayesian, putting down what I expect to have happen, what, what I expect to see. Whereas an objectivist would say, no, it's really uh, a statement about something true in the, it, about the objective world, and, and, and you, will, you can measure that truth with, with frequencies um, you know, by lots of, lots of observations. And so my, my view then is more like Chris Fuchs in the subjectivist view, but in which case then I don't need to have all these worlds out there. I, I, it's just I, I, I'm, I'm positing, well, okay, maybe the coin is comes heads or maybe it comes up tails. I don't need to have a world branching out there. I'm just wondering about the difference. So I don't need to have all this metaphysical excess of, well, there's a whole universe in which the thing came up heads, another one in which it came up tails. That, that's a, you know, it's a, a metaphysically high price to pay for being, you know. But it's so, go. what I find so funny about this, because I now understand this after a year of, of sort of getting my head around it, is that I now understand that your position makes less metaphysical claims because people on the street will think you're making a crazy metaphysical claim that consciousness is primary and they say of course there's a world out there and they'll maybe have read something about the many worlds interpretation that there is parallel universes and that they think is sort of a, not a met metaphysical claim so where's this uh, how do we how did we end up in the, this sort of misunderstanding of what metaphysics uh, what is sort of a heavy metaphysical claim and a light one well, I, I think many of us intuitively would agree with Einstein, right? Well, Einstein was a realist, and, and he uh, thought that the moon was there when no one looked, right? He didn't think that the act of observation, when I look up there and see the moon, that I'm creating the moon when I look at it. it it's, the moon is really there, and Einstein wanted physics to be that way. And he didn't like the spooky interactions at a distance that he, that he himself sort of pointed out in quantum theory, that... that Things could happen and faster than the speed of light, apparently, and and or, but of course there weren't any causal interactions. They were nothing, nothing, no information traveling through space faster, faster than the speed of light, as it turned out. But he didn't like it because he, he wanted to have a sort of a Newtonian, a classical worldview, right? Where yeah, space and time was was much more interesting than Newton thought, it, but but nevertheless it, it wasn't spooky like quantum theory seemed to be. So, Indicating, and so I think most of us intuitively would ag would agree with Einstein, and he, you know he's not bad company. To you know, if, if Einstein thinks that uh, you know space and time are fundamental and objects are, are the moon is there when no one exists, who am I to argue with Einstein? So so I think a lot of us intuitively think that, and and I, and I think I know why. Um, the developmental psychologists have told us why. So Piaget um, said that. Children, he thought by the time they're about 18 months of age, get what he calls object permanence. 
That is, we're programmed <clears throat> genetically at, at a certain point in our lives to just believe that, you know, I mean, up to a point, you know, when mommy has the, the doll and it's in, where I can play with it, that the doll exists while I'm playing with it. But as soon as mommy takes the doll and puts it behind the pillow and I don't see it, it's gone. It, it doesn't exist. Until you're around 18 months of age, according to Piaget, Later work showed us maybe three or four months of age, much, much earlier than you thought, where you get what's called object permanence, which is the, <clears throat> the pre-programmed belief that that object really exists even when you don't perceive it. So you start to become a metaphysical realist, not because you're argued into it, because you're programmed to believe it. So, so the reason why it's so hard for us to let go of the idea that the moon doesn't exist except when you look and create it, right? To let, well, to, to let go of the idea that, 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 that things really are there, right? We want the dolly to be there. We want the moon to be there. It's because we believed that before we were rational. It's, it's, it's the water we swim in intellectually. And so it's really hard for us to, to even see that, to question it. It's, it's, when I, I remember giving a talk to, to my own department, cognitive science department, where I was explaining my argument from evolution, why we are creating everything that we see on the fly. So I have an argument, so the physicists have an argument that space-time isn't fundamental and, and therefore, you know, somehow the act of observation must be creating what we're, because it's not, it's not space-time, whatever it is there. I have an argument from from evolution of natural selection to the same. So I gave it to my department uh, a few years ago, and the argument was pretty clear. So they were nodding their heads and, oh yeah. And, and I, I realized that they, they, were, they followed the argument, but they didn't know what it really meant. So I said, look, this means that neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. Neurons cause none of our behavior. And then look of horror throughout the, all my colleagues who used to think that I you know, was a reasonable and possibly intelligent guy, all of a sudden like looks of horror. What, what is this guy saying? So, so it's, it's not, it's a deep emotional thing. It's just like being told that someone that you thought you knew really well all your life has been in a, a suit and they're really a Komodo dragon and you, did, you didn't know it. It's just, it's just that appalling an idea that, um, you know. And how has, this been, how has this all been for you personally? I mean, because it's, this is all intellectual and mathematics, because, but at night when Donald goes to bed and you <laughs> ponder about this, you know, how does that sort of... Uh, What's the impact? What has the impact been on you personally? Well, it's, it's, I, I know firsthand how difficult it is to let go of the object permanence. I see it, that is my default mode. So even though I've been working on this mathematics and publishing papers for decades on, on this kind of topic, um, when I'm not paying attention, I'm a, I'm a realist. Uh, you know, the moon, I mean, I just automatically fall t to that point of view. So it's, 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 the way I think about it is like, if you've ever played a virtual reality game that's highly immersive, right? You put on a headset and bodysuit, and uh, you, you, you know when you first get in, hey, look, you know, this beautiful world that I'm involved in, maybe it's Grand Theft Auto or whatever it might be, some you know, VR version of that. Um, you're, so you're immersed, you're seeing all this stuff, and when you first go in, you, you have this sense of detachment. Here I am, outside of the game, with just this headset on. But once you get into it, <laughs> you're in the game, and, and your emotions get tied up in it, and, and you, you lose yourself in the game. You, and, and so, effectively, that's what I'm saying is happening here. Um, Space-time is just our headset, but we lose ourselves in the game. And we, we lose, uh, we, we take the game as, as the reality, and what, what science has done, what physics has done, is study space-time very, very well. It studied our headset. And they, they, they studied the headset so well that they, they discovered it's just a headset. And that's the power of the scientific method, right? We studied space-time because we thought it was a fundamental reality. We were lost in the game. But we, because we didn't just wave our hands and get dogmatic about it, we actually, you know, we wrote down equations, and then Einstein wrote down, you know, with, Einstein was the one that really blew this thing open with general relativity because he, he had the notion like in 1907 that if I was in an elevator standing on a, a scale to weigh myself and all of a sudden the cord broke and the elevator started in free fall, 
how much would I weigh on that scale? And Einstein realized, I wouldn't weigh anything. That was, he said, what the, like the happiest thought of his life. That was the key idea for general relativity. If I was on a free-falling elevator and standing on a, on a scale, I would weigh nothing. Brilliant idea. It took Einstein, I don't know, seven or eight years or something like that, of intense work to turn that idea into mathematics. And it was, seven, I mean, he's Einstein, right? He's not some schmuck. He was really, this really, really smart guy he takes his, it takes him seven or eight years. He has to learn the mathematics. It was fairly unusual mathematics, Riemannian geometry and so forth. But he, he, he learned the mathematics and struggled and struggled and finally turned it into mathematics so like in 1915 and, and turned that idea into one equation. And that one equation then, a year later, uh, a guy named Schwarzschild, um, a German guy, like, I guess he was fighting in World War I and had time to, you know, and the brilliance to, to work on Einstein's equations, discovered what we now call the solution that's called black holes. And Einstein didn't know about black, black, black holes. And he didn't like it. But his, so the, the key thing was, you can be as smart as Einstein and be so smart that you write down the, the, the field equations of general relativity. And then those equations come back and teach you something fundamental about black holes. And, they then, and, and black holes are what tell you that space-time cannot be fundamental itself. There's got to be something beyond. And so, so that is what I love about um, the, the hard-nosed scientific attitude is turn it into mathematics. The, if, if, if you have a theory that is good enough to tell you where it stops, that's the kind of theory that is the heart and soul of science. If you have a theory that allows you to dodge and weave and, and always dodge any objection, I have absolutely no interest. You're not playing the science game. You're, you're playing some personal game. Yeah, yeah. And and if we had to, um, if we, let, let's stay in that hat set metaphor, which you've used very often, of course, and it's a great metaphor. First of all, were you happy with the movie The Matrix? What it did sort of culturally with that metaphor? Yeah, I think the well, the, the Matrix really does open people's minds up to the possibility that what they're experiencing is just a simulation, right? Now, in, in the matrix, though, once you pop out of the simulation, it's, it's, it's another space-time world. So when Neo takes off the headset, um, he's back in a space-time world, right? And, and so is Trinity and everybody. They're all, they're all in a space-time world. So, so this, what I'm saying, is even more radical, that, that whatever is beyond space-time is utterly unlike space and time. It's, it's, it's utterly outside of space and time. And that's really hard to think outside of the space-time box. When I talk about conscious agents, people go, where are they? I mean, and then, well, they're not in space and time, where are they? And you have to turn things around. Space and time is inside the minds of the conscious agents. Um, it's just like someone inside the, the virtual reality game of uh, Grand Theft Auto. You know, if, if, if you, the players inside could say, you think you're not, that you're not really riding a red Mustang and you don't think that green Ferrari really exists, where, well, where are you? Well, I'm outside of the game. I, I, this game is just a headset. But if you're not on the game, where could you possibly be? If, where else is there besides the game? And, and that's the, the same situation we have with space-time. We, we can't think about being outside of that game. But that's what our mathematics is telling us. You've got to think outside of that box. And the best physicists are, you know, well, the best. In the, the physicists that I'm really interested in, like Neymar, Kani Hamed, and Juan Maldesad, and, and others, Benny Casa, uh, these guys are, are, are taking the bold step of uh, moving beyond space-time and they are finding beautiful structures beyond space-time that are really, um, they don't know what they're about, but they're there. Yeah, I mean, I think what people find so hard and also me myself, at first you, um, I was more sort of attracted to this idea of um, our brains being a receiver to a larger consciousness, right? That you see sort of the radio, what's that interpretation called? I think it's Aldous Huxley who sort of popularized popularize the idea and uh, but you also say that your brain itself is just a sort of and your whole body itself is a projection in space-time now it's not real it has no causal uh, a role to play for consciousness at all that, that, that's right so I right now I don't have a brain I have no neurons if you looked inside my skull you would find neurons and brains but that's 
because you would create them as you looked. The act of observation is creating what you see. So the, the brain isn't a receiver for consciousness because the brain doesn't even exist. The brain itself is just a symbol inside of consciousness that consciousness makes now and then and then deletes. So it's just like when, uh, if you're playing a virtual reality game, like, uh, like the Grand Theft Auto, and you have your headset on, and if I look over to the right, and I'll see a green Mustang. Well, there is no green Mustang, right? What I'm really interacting with in this, in this metaphor is some supercomputer somewhere. It's got all this megabytes of software and diodes and resistors and voltages and magnetic fields. I don't know anything about that. I don't have to know, but that's the reality, quote unquote, in this metaphor. There's no green Mustangs inside that computer anywhere. There's nothing green inside that computer that looks like a Mustang. So I'm creating the Mustang when I look, and I'm deleting it when I look over here. Now I see a, you know, a white Porsche. Well, I, now I've deleted the green Mustang, and I'm, I'm creating the white Porsche. So we're, we create the stuff on the fly. But someone has to look, someone else might be looking at that green Mustang, right? For that person, it will still exist. So, um, but, it, but the it will be a different green Mustang than the one I saw, right? Because I create my own Mustang in my head and they create their green Mustang in, in their head. And we think that we're seeing the same Mustang because we agree, we, is there a Mustang to my right? Oh yeah, there's a Mustang to your right. And so we, we think that we're, we're seeing exactly the same. And that's that baby principle, the object permanence you mentioned, right? That my, my child uh, learns permanence. that. And, um, but the hard part also is that people find difficult to understand is that if, for instance, I take alcohol or psychedelics, uh, which is something in space time, that definitely has a causal effect on my consciousness, right? Right. So, so it's absolutely the case that space and time are an interface that allow us to do things that can affect consciousness. So, so for right, for example, right now, um, you are affecting my consciousness, and you're you're doing it through space and time. You're you're doing it through an interface. So we know that even with the idea that consciousness is fundamental, that one consciousness can affect another consciousness through the intermediary of space and time. And in fact, that's what space and time are. They are this interface. It's an interface that some conscious agents use to interact with other conscious agents. So it's no surprise that actions that we take using that interface could affect our consciousness. That's what the interface is for. Now, but the reason why people have a hard time understanding this is because we make another mistake. We mistake, because we mistake our interface for reality, we also make a, a fundamental mistake that things that look simple to us are therefore necessarily simple in and of themselves. And things that look dead to us are necessarily dead. So, so for example, you know, if I look in the mirror, I see my face. I, I presume when I look at your face, you're conscious. And um, so faces point to conscious objects. Those, well, I look at my cat, I, it's surely alive and it's sh probably conscious. And an ant, cer certainly alive, people might begin to wonder about consciousness. When I get down to a microbe, alive, probably not conscious. And when you get down to virus, now we even debate about whether it's alive. When we get down to particles, absolutely not alive. And, and only if you're a panpsychist would you might, you might say that they have some consciousness associated with them. But a physicalist would, would say no consciousness. That whole way of looking at things is fundamentally flawed. It's mistaking a limit of our interface for an insight into the nature of reality. An interface necessarily has to simplify things. Uh, that's what an interface is there for. It's, it's, it's to hide most of the reality, and the part of reality that it shows you, it's dumbing it down. Well, so with certain symbols, like human bodies and human faces, we get perhaps the most insight into other consciousnesses. With other symbols, like cat and dog and mouse, we get less insight. And with other symbols, we get almost no insight. Well, that doesn't mean that I'm not interacting with consciousness. It just means that my interface gave up. Well, no surprise, that's what interfaces do. They give up at some point. But it's a rookie mistake to take the pixels of my desktop interface as the fundamental elements of reality. And, and so right now I'm looking at a bunch of pixels, which is you know Hans's face. So those pixels are conscious. But if I go sw smaller and smaller, the, you know, the pixels that correspond to the door behind you or whatever, those aren't, well, that's, that's, that's 
that's the wrong way to think about the pixels. This is just, those are just pixels. They're, they're a portal through which I'm actually interacting with something on the other side. So we've, we've mistaken our interface for the reality. So our, the distinction that we make between conscious and unconscious and between living and non-living is not a principal distinction. A distinction. It's a mistake. It's, it's, it's a rookie mistake that, that we make by mistaking our space-time headset for the final truth. And so, so as a result, now to get back to your question, when we start to do things like take drugs or get hit on the head and we, we have changes in consciousness, well, the, first, there's no surprise that the interface allows you to change consciousness. That's what it's for. It's what consciousness is used to interact and affect other consciousnesses. When I have something that I call a drug, if I'm a physicalist, I'm thinking, these, hey, there's nothing to this but, but some chemicals, right? This is a chemical formula. There's no consciousness here. So here is this physical thing, a chemical, and look, it's taking down your consciousness. So that shows that physicalism is true. Physicalism, you know, your brain is um, creating your consciousness, and this drug is affecting your brain, so it's changing your consciousness. But again, it's a rookie mistake. Just because something is so simple in my interface that it looks like a chemical, doesn't mean I'm not interacting with consciousness. It just means that I'm getting very, very little insight from my interface into the consciousness that I'm interacting with. So I'm always dealing with behind the screen of my interface. And I'm always dealing with consciousness. Just like in Grand Theft Auto, um, behind the screen, I'm dealing first with a, a supercomputer, but then with all the other people around the world that have their headsets and bodysuits on. I'm affecting them. I'm talking with them through, the, through that interface. And so, um, it's no surprise that the interface is giving me no insight into the consciousness that I'm, I'm interacting with. But what is the glory of science is it has the tools to tell us a headset is just a headset. And that's what the math is telling us. When, when they say space-time is doomed, the, the, basically physics has learned the headset is just a headset. And we're starting to look outside the headset. Now, uh, Nima and, and these other physicists, I'm not saying that they in any way endorse my idea that consciousness is fundamental. So I would, I would bet that they don't. I would think that they um, are, are just saying, look, we're finding these structures beyond space time. I don't know what they're about yet, but we're just, let's stick with the math. Let's find these structures and show how space time arises. And, and Hats off to that. That's, that's, I think, brilliant. Yeah, but at least they agree with you on the point that what we're in uh, is not fundamental. So this, this, yeah, if you call it a headset or not, but space-time cannot be it. And there you, there, there you agree. And absolutely, and what they're, makes they're, exactly, when they say space-time is doomed, I've heard you explain this a lot of times, but I'd like to hear it now from you again, and maybe in different words today. But what makes you take the leap then? to say if space-time is not fundamental, consciousness must be? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple reasons. Uh, maybe the, the, the biggest one is the poverty of my imagination. Uh, what else would I do? It's sort of like what if I, I'm interested in consciousness. You know, I'm interested in my emotions, my sensory experiences, um, the, the sense that I have of being even when I'm not really perceiving or thinking, I'm still, you know, when you're at night with your eyes closed and you're not seeing anything or perceiving anything, you're, you're still, there is this sense of I am, the, the sense of being there. And it's perfectly plausible if space-time is fundamental and physicalism is true and reductionism is true, to, to take all of that stuff that I just said, you know, my conscious experience and so forth, as, well, that's not real. And I'm, I'm just a brain, I'm just a body, and this is perhaps, um, you know, some weird effect of matter when it gets complicated enough. And, but when space-time isn't fundamental, and I realize that, that particles are not fundamental, and reductionism, as, as, as Nima Arkani Hamed has said, you know, reductionism is dead. Reductionism is, is completely dead. It, it, it doesn't work. So, so many physicalists, many of my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience, uh, who are, and some of them will be here at this, at this workshop. Um, so they're cognitive neuroscientists, I would say to, almost to a person, every one of them is a physicalist. Uh, um, 
And so they're looking to see how consciousness emerges from complex neural activity or, or whatever, you know, integrated information or global workspaces or neuronal microtubule collapses. So they're, they're, they're not going to think of consciousness as being fundamental. They're going to think of it as somehow emerging. So they want, but they want, to, they, they take consciousness seriously. So here's the, here, so most of my physicalist colleagues, not all, but most take consciousness seriously. They, they, they say it's not something to just be dismissed. It's not an illusion. You know, Dan Dennett and Keith Frankish will say it's an illusion. It's just, just flat out an illusion. You know, we've been misled. Um, but most will not. But, but they have not been able with their own theories, and this did affect me. When I looked at their theories, I realized I, there's no beef here they're, they're in, in the following sense. Specifically, there's no specific conscious experience that anybody's ever explained. Right? Integrated information theory. I, I, asked, I asked Giulio Tononi about this back in the late 1990s. He came to talk er, early on in his career at the University of California, Irvine, at the Helmholtz Club, and we had him there. And so I asked him at the Helmholtz Club you know, to give me a particular example. He couldn't do it. You know, one specific, you know, the taste of chocolate or the, you know, the feeling of a headache or the, the smell of garlic or whatever. What is the specific conscious experience that your theory can say? This is the integrated information that must be that conscious experience. It, could, it, it must be the taste of chocolate. It couldn't be the... So, the yeah, and we're talking here about the, the code. Let's call it the algorithm or show me the code, the exact code that must be the taste of chocolate or, or garlic, it, uh, smell it, of garlic. Exactly right. The, the right, because the, the, in some sense you can think about what they're doing is proposing these circuits, right? The, the, the circuits have certain kind of integrated information. So, so okay, great. Sounds very, very rigorous. Give me the circuit for one conscious, just one. I, I just want a circuit that you say must be one specific, specific conscious experience. It must be, you know, the taste of vanilla. And it could not be the smell of garlic. Just give me one. But, but we're trying to do science here. We need some predictions of specific. It's the, the predictions they're making is, am I conscious at all or not? And that is an artifact. What they're getting is an artifact of our interface. When I get a certain kind of complexity now in my interface, I can start to see the consciousness. That doesn't mean I'm, that there, there's no consciousness otherwise. It just means that that's when my interface lets me see the consciousness. So it's no surprise that you can get these complexity measures in the variables of your interface about when you can detect consciousness or not. That, that's no surprise. That, that follows from my theory, that, that you know, my approach in which consciousness is fundamental. So that's no surprise. What would be a surprise, from my point of view, is if they could explain any specific conscious experience. So every, I'll say this, there is no physicalist theory that has at any time proposed a specific conscious experience that they can explain. There's not one on the table. And I, you know, I ask, I mean, and again, nothing personal here. I'm friends with a lot of these people. I, you know, I'm friends with Stuart Hameroff. And, and last time I was on stage with him, I pressed him, give me one, Stuart. What is the orchestrated collapse of, uh, you know, quantum states, uh, in neuronal microtubules, that must be whatever you want. You know, the, the, the smell of uh, barbecue, whatever, whatever you want. You think he's still like Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose are, are physicalists in that sense? They, they are like the objective um, um, uh, collapse uh, kind of school, right? Which states that there must be an external real world out there. Well, either that or, 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 or dualist, but, but probably mostly physicalist. Um, I, I would say that, that somehow... <clears throat> This, this non-computational aspect of physics, they think, may be in somehow where consciousness somehow emerges. But w what I want when I talk with Stuart is, OK, great. Give me one. What is the specific orchestrated collapse of neuronal microtubule states that must be whatever you want? Can you give me one? And last, so I had to really press him on the stage it took me several presses to really get him to say, I don't have one. And he knows the next time we're friends, I'd love to have a beer with him and so forth. He's a, he's a great guy. Next time I'm on stage with him, I'm going to ask the same question. And, he, and I'm sure he knows it. I'll ask the same question. And, and the, the point is, and again, this is nothing personal. These are good friends. And what I'm hoping is, I mean, they're so smart. If I can get them off of this physicalist thing where they're, they're doomed to fail, right? Space time is doomed. There's no way 
that you can boot up a theory of consciousness if you start with particles or any structures inside space-time. You cannot do it. So, so I see all of my, my friends and colleagues in this field, many of them just IQs out the wazoo. But when you have, I mean, if, if I'm trying to set up, um, for example, a theory of space travel, and I believe in flat Earth, they're, they're, good luck. I mean, you, you just have sort of the wrong framework to think about space travel. Yeah, I think for people, it's just very nice to bring it back to the, the because people know the matrix, they know sort of VR metaphors. Um, to sum up everything we've discussed so far, so when we entered this game or this simulation or this matrix, um, object permanence sort of psychologically made us forget that we put on a headset in the first place. And now we are sitting here as two adults and, and you it's your life's work to sort of uh, get to the point that you know we, are, uh, we have a headset on and to describe that headset. And then of course, to think about how we can put it off again, right? That, that, that's right. Um, and <clears throat> once we realized that space and time were not fundamental, space-time is doomed and reductionism is dead, then we're free to begin to think about what's beyond space-time. And my hypothesis that it, is that it's a network of conscious agents. <clears throat> and I have a, you know, with my colleagues, Chaitan Prakash and Manish Singh and, and, and Chris Fields and Robert Prentner and others, I, we're all developing this mathematical model. Not that I believe that we're right. I don't. I, it's, I believe Gödel that any mathematical model that we come up with will only be scratching the surface. But I don't think that we're wasting our time. We, we in some sense, make some progress. We do at least counter our own dogmatism, and we look beyond. And somehow, when we get new, deeper theories, we also get new, deeper te technologies that are telling us somehow that that we're, we're getting some kind of insights that are tapping into something that we couldn't tap into before. So this, so I'm working with my colleagues, uh, collaborators, on, on this mathematical theory of, of conscious agents. And then <clears throat> what we have to do is show how space-time emerges specifically, right, with mathematical precision. We have to show exactly how space-time emerges um, as, as a headset. So what is it about the dynamics of conscious agents that is being captured by the, by the space-time headset that, that we use? You, can you prove that, Donald? That's, it's my lack of understanding of mathematics, but can you prove something like that mathematically? That, that is what yes. you can do? <clears throat> well, well, what you can, I, I wouldn't use the word prove, but what you can do is you can write down a mathematical projection. So you can say, here is this mathematical model of conscious agents. It's like, like the Twitterverse, right? So it's a big social network. And you can say, here's how Twitter works. You know, this guy tweets and he follows and he retweets. So you can sort of write down the, the laws of how t tweeting works. So it's like that. So I've got this social network of conscious agents. They have their own laws about how they work. And then you can look at the patterns that evolve in, in that, right? So like in, with the Twitterverse, it's like what is trending and why and so forth. And how do you get these little in-groups where you you know, have echo chambers and so forth. <clears throat> so you can look at all the things that happen. Then you can say, okay, let's ask what about, what aspects of this complicated dynamics of conscious agents get mapped into what we call space and time? How precisely, with mathematical precision, what, like what are the trends in the behaviors of conscious agents? And, that, and really that's the way we think about the, we call, Technically we call it the asymptotic or long-term behavior. But it's really like trends in, in social media. <clears throat> how, how shall we capture those long-term behaviors, those trends, in the format of space and time and what we call physical objects? How do we do that? So we, we've actually, and I'm all at this workshop, I'm going to be pr proposing a mathematically precise path. It, I mean, <clears throat> I won't say the path now because it's just a bunch of mathematics. It wouldn't make any sense. But there are. There are like five or six steps, precise mathematical steps from the dynamics of conscious agents, all through permutations, through these polytopes, through the amplitudehedron and into space-time. So, so there's this mapping that, that, and so the idea then is I've got this high level picture with my team and now we have to work out, it's gonna take years to work out all the details of each step in this. But, but we see the path from the dynamics of conscious agents through permutations and 
you know, Birkhoff polytopes to you know, Grassmannians to epitohedron into space time. So there's a lot of work to be done, but once we do that, once we have enough progress on that, then we can get to the other thing you're talking about, which is it'll give us new technologies, essentially. We, once we know what's beyond, what, well, I won't say once we know what's beyond space time. Once we have our first baby step theory, the first baby step beyond space time that, that's really solid, and it'll be, you know, conscious agents 1.0, then maybe, you know, in five years it'll be conscious agents 10.0 or something like that. Hopefully it'll We'll move quickly yeah. and, and, but and throw is, away the But this is bad. like fundamental stuff, right? This is the real cool stuff. We are still thinking of traveling in space-time, and we have all these space-time fantasies, right? And so also science fiction, don't you think that when you look at like what Christopher Nolan does in in uh, in his movies, that's, that's really great. I admire it as a filmmaker. I think it's absolutely fantastic, and it's very close to science. But uh, to me, the, the really fascinating stuff also for art is to fantasize about... Uh, what we could do, right? Because when we go outside of space time, we do not have a clue what what's what what we're waiting for, right? That, that's right. So <clears throat> one of the things that that occurs to me, um, most of the galaxies that we can see, we could never go to. Space is expanding so quickly that we could never get to them through space, moving at the speed of light. So there's all this real estate out there that we can see that's waving at us and saying, nanny, nanny, you can never get here. Well, that's if you go through space-time. But if space-time is just a headset, think about the options that come. You don't have to go through space-time. You could go around space-time. So think about Grand Theft Auto. And it, everybody that's got the headset on is playing Grand Theft Auto. They're stuck within the game. But if you're a software engineer who knows about the computer and the software, you could, you could take the guy who's driving the fastest car and winning the game, you could give him flat tires out of, out of nowhere. You could take the gas out of his tank. You could turn his car upside down and put it somewhere else anytime you want to. You're not stuck in space and time. The, the, the whole notion of causality, nothing can go faster than a certain speed inside Grand Theft Auto. And in space time, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Well, that's, that's all just part of the, the headset. Once you go outside this headset, you can tinker with it. But then you're also sort of, then we uh, also can, can take the, the matrix metaphor again, right? The, this is like Neo programming itself, like new skills out of nowhere. Uh, it potentially could be possible, you're saying. It, it certainly does seem to be quite possible that we could be interacting with other conscious agents in, in a, a way that we can't even conceive right now and, and tapping into an intelligence that is inconceivable, literally inconceivable because it transcends any conceptual system. That, and if this idea that we are consciousness is correct, and that that's what is the fundamental reality, then, then Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us that, in fact, you and I already are that infinite intelligence we projected into a particular headset and waking up to that fact. Um, and that then, you know, raises an interesting question, which is, <clears throat> what is consciousness doing and wh why? And and what Gödel seems to be saying to us is that there's an infinite, unbounded, unstop, unstoppable realm of exploration that consciousness needs to do. And so what consciousness is doing is exploring all of its possibilities, and one, uh, uh, to, maybe to understand itself. So it's the old um, Delphi, or Oracle of Delphi, um, you know, the, the, Know thyself at the, at the, at the, yeah. the temple. But do you think uh, a lot of questions here? Um, one, I'd like to uh, the ontology of conscious agents. What are your thoughts here? I mean, what are we talking about? Those conscious agents outside of space time? Are we, I mean, people would say we think spirits or gods, but any thoughts? Right. So <clears throat> the, the theory that we have. Um, picks th just two aspects of consciousness. Because when you're trying to do a scientific theory, 
What you're trying to do is say, what are the minimal ingredients that I need to boot up a completely general theory? Right, and if you, if you ask yourself the question, so what, what, if I'm thinking about consciousness being fundamental, well, what kinds of things do I want to really understand? Well, I need to understand experiences, I need to understand free will and, or action, I need to understand learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, the notion of a self, uh, emotions. What, so now if I just assume all that stuff, I'm not, doing, I'm not do, making a scientific theory, I'm just saying, well, that's what, I'm just sort of sitting back with a beer and saying, well, that's what exists. But if I'm trying to do a scientific theory, I have to, I'm, what I have to do is, to play that game, is I have to say, okay, what, out of all that stuff I was talking about and more that you know, consciousness has to be dealing with, what are the two things or the one thing that I need to really turn into mathematics and say this is the foundation and then boot up everything else? That's what science is about. So what we've picked is there are conscious experiences like the taste of chocolate. And those, ex those conscious experiences can influence other conscious experiences. Those are the assumptions. <laughs> That's it. There are experiences, and experiences probabilistically influence other experiences. That's the minimal. That's, so notice there's no notion of memory, problem solving, self. None of that stuff is there. So we, we have to build all that stuff from yeah. the raw materials of just conscious experiences affecting other conscious experiences. And that's what, so that's what we're really up to, is a mathematical model of that. Now you could say, look, you picked the wrong starting point. And that's fine. That, I, I, that's the kind of critique that I would welcome. I'd say, okay, pick some other starting point, make your own networks of whatever you want to call them, um, yeah. but then you'll be having to explain other things. And that's, that's perfectly fine. So I, I picked what I thought I couldn't get away with. I, I mean, I, and one reason why you want as few things as possible to, that you're assuming it to begin with is because the things you assume are your miracles, right? The scientific theory has its assumptions. Every theory has an assumption. Those assumptions are the things you're saying, if you grant me these assumptions, then I can explain all this other good stuff. But I'm not explaining these assumptions, and that's what I mean when I say they're, mir they're miracles for that theory. They're the things that you just say, please let me have this, and then I'll explain all this other stuff. So you want to have your miracles as few as possible. Now, of course, I've helped myself to a big miracle, conscious experiences. Yeah, There's which is, I wide think, variety of conscious it's very natural to say this is, the, it's only, only the last couple of hundred years that we find that a weird assumption to make, but actually it's the only thing we have, right? That, that This is Descartes. But then we forgot forgot about that, and we got so immersed in 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 the what we assume to be the real world that we forgot about that that primacy primacy of, of consciousness. That's what dawned to me. I mean, we were looking inside conscious. We're doing the the, the large hadron collider. We do that in consciousness. We <laughs> let these particles accelerate and uh, burst into each other. That it's within consciousness. Everything, right? Yeah, that's that's so. That, that's, that's exactly right. So when, when you start to look at it, you realize, well, no, I've, I've, this has just been a headset all along. Space and time has just been a headset all along. It's, con it's really consciousness looking at other consciousnesses through, through this filter. And so, yeah, con the experiences are fundamental. My experience of space and time is just my experience. It, that's, and as, as soon as I close my eyes, the moon literally disappears. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really, it's gone. Now, there's something out there, not, not out there in the sense of out there in space, but there's something out you know, beyond my experiences, and it's, by hypothesis, other conscious agents. So I'm interacting with other conscious agents, and what I see are things like the moon, or um, an amoeba, or a rock. It's not that the rock is conscious, it's just, the, it's just like, again, like the pixels in, in my Grand Theft Auto headset that are, that are um, that, that I see as a Porsche, those pixels are not a Porsche. Those are just pixels. I'm making the, I'm making the Porsche in my consciousness, you know, right? So, and that's the same thing. So I'm not saying that the rock is conscious. The rock is my, my pixelated headset. It, it, it's pointing to, when I look at, uh, at, at Hans, right? I, I see a face, skin, hair, and eyes. That, what I'm seeing is not your consciousness. I'm seeing 
something that I created. In fact, that hands is now gone. <laughs> and now, now it's there. So, but your consciousness presumably stayed there even when I wasn't yeah, paying attention It's an to icon it. that so, refers to something else. And um, what I'm wondering, it's also a question I had, is uh, could it be that those conscious agents in creating uh, space-time, as I had said, built in uh, certain hacks, so to speak, we know, for instance, uh, death is one. I mean, if I jump uh, uh, in front of a train, I'll die and I'll, I'll somehow, right? We know that uh, the hat sets off then, right? Or I suppose that. And what are other ones? I mean, is meditation one or psychedelics one? What are your thoughts there? I think that there's an infinite variety. That, that the headset that we have right now is just one of it, literally an infinite variety. And so this, is, this might sound similar to um, an idea that a physicist named Max Tegmark has put out. So, so Max Tegmark has the idea of these multiverses, but um, he thinks that mathematics is fundamental, that it is the fundamental reality, not consciousness, mathematics, and not space-time, at least not our space-time. And, and also, I think, building on Gödel's incompleteness theorem, he's, he points out that there's an infinite variety of mathematics out there. And so that's his level, what he calls level four multiverse. Every kind of mathematics that is possible is actual, and it's all out there. So it's, it really exists. And my guess is in a similar spirit. I, I don't take mathematics as fundamental. I take consciousness as fundamental. But, and mathematics is like the bones of the living organism of consciousness. So it's, it's different from Max Tegmark's view. But where it's similar is, whereas Max says, Everything that's mathematically possible is mathematically real, and that's my multiverse. I'm saying every structure of consciousness that's mathematically possible is, math is consciously real. And that's my consciousness multiverse with all the possible headsets that, that it could, could have. And so our little space-time one uh, is presumably one of just many that are, that are concretely right now inconceivable to us. But, but what's interesting to me about consciousness is in this framework, why is it doing this? Why, why should consciousness go to all the effort of, like, are, are, this is a pretty amazing space-time universe. Right? It's like billions of light years across. It's got trillions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies. And in this framework in which consciousness is fundamental, what, what was happened to it, consciousness put on this headset, programmed itself to get lost in it, to think of itself as a tiny little object in this vast universe, and then to slowly wake up and to recognize as vast and as amazing as this whole thing is, I transcend it. Is that what consciousness is about? It, it's, it's knowing what it is, by knowing what it's not. So it really immerses itself into a headset like space and time and gets lost in it and flounders in it and really it has to like learn how to play it. You're like, don't touch the fire, you'll burn it. You're like, we really have, don't step in front of the car. You, you, you learn, it's painful and you learn, all, and so you're learning all how this headset works and then you're learning about the, how fantastic it is and then you wake up and realize, I'm not a little thing inside that headset. That headset, headset is a tiny little thing inside of me. I am not that. And that's how consciousness is knowing itself. And maybe if Gödel, one way of interpreting Gödel is that that process is never ending. Um, there may be a deeper way in which you can just view it as, as a vast, incredible intelligence that just knows that, but every perspective on that gives you this temporal feeling of coming and waking up to it. So there may be an even deeper perspective in which the, you could look at the whole thing as you know, just a vast intelligence that already knows it all, but any projection of that, you're seeing it as a process of coming to know itself. Um, but, so what's interesting is if, if this is anywhere close to right, then you and I and every, anybody that, you know, any person is really part of that infinite intelligence, but wearing a headset. But we're wearing a headset that has really 
strict limits on it. If I ask you, please imagine a color that you've never seen before, just one specific color that you've never seen before. Well, does anything happen? <laughs> nothing, I mean, nothing happens. But, but, but there, you know, it turns out that there are women called tetrafems who have four color receptors. Most, most guys have three, 93% you know, of men have three color receptors, 7% of men have only two. These women have four color receptors and experiments strongly suggest that they have a new dimension of color experience that no man could ever imagine and most women can't imagine either. And, and so they're having concrete experiences that you and I can't even, we can't even imagine. And, and so what's stunning to me is that consciousness, if, if we, if you and I really are not separate, we're just, we're just different headsets on the one big consciousness, the, the, the one infinitely intelligent consciousness. So we're not separate from that. We really, I mean, it'd be it's pretty stunning that we are actually not just connected with, we are projections of that infinite intelligence. But projections that we've taken the projections so seriously that we can't even imagine a new color. We've re really restricted our imagination, even though within consciousness at a deeper level, all things are possible. All possible experiences are there. Yeah, we truly sort of somehow forgot who we are and the function being to expand um, yeah, expand this whole thing, right? It was needed somehow to, but but what I'm wondering here, I I heard you say uh, you're reading or maybe even um, re reevaluating religious literature, and because this is so similar, of course, to Eastern philosophy and uh, um, traditions of meditation that that tend to bring you back to sort of this primordial awareness that you're a part of and make you see that all else is is created from from that awareness. So I'm just wondering here what your thoughts are. Is science and uh, these uh, tra traditions of introspection mostly, are they coming together? Are we going to see a science that sort of includes introspection maybe even? I, I think that we'll need to go there. I, I think that that's, we'll need scientists, if this idea is anywhere near right, and we really are um, con the infinite consciousness in, in a space-time headset, <clears throat> then the best way to do our scientific research is, of course, to use our mathematics and to do all the stuff that we're doing right now, the study and so forth, but then also to step back, to literally let go of thought completely and just dive back into that non-conceptual infinite intelligence. You're doing that, right? You, you I ask. Do. I, I spend a couple hours a day, even more, two or three hours a day um, meditating. And are you then breaking outside the headset? I mean, uh, or making a tiny crack into the headset? I would say tiny crack. When I when I read the experiences of others, I would say that um, there are many far more advanced than me. <laughs> but 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 I do. I do go into periods of, of complete inner silence, and I think in those periods, or probably when whatever ideas I have that are that might be of any interest come from from that that, and I think that if we really cultivate that as scientists and, and as, and, uh, you know, as, as, you know, artists and writers and so forth, whatever endeavor we might be involved in, going into ultimate, s complete silence, it, letting go of the restrictions of our conceptual system really puts us in touch with this infinite intelligence from which we can then take back insights that we can try to then reconceptualize and, 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 and make um, useful in, in this headset. And many of the great scientists seem to talk in ways that suggest that, like Einstein would say that he, he wasn't really getting the ideas from just the equations. He, was, he would go and have these vague feelings and ideas and, and I, you know, pictures or something like that. And it would take him a long time to turn the stuff into language and, and, and mathematics. But he was, so he would, you know, suggest that he was going, and many, I think, many of the great physicists <coughs> and, and scientists more generally, and then, of course, people in the arts and humanities who are doing wonderful work, um, they're getting their inspiration, probably even with just b brief 
periods of, of silence. Maybe that they don't even know. That this, when they go into that inner silence that, that we let go of the headset temporarily and tap into this deeper intelligence. So that could be, uh, I would, if this is right, I would suggest that in the future we would train our, our scientists with all of the standard tools, but also treat, uh, teach them to tap into this infinite intelligence as well. Spend time on a regular basis um, letting go of all of your theories and recognizing that, hey, in some sense, every theory we come up with here is child's play. All of it is child's play. It's, uh, Gödel tells us, everything that you come up with is child's play. Th there's, there's a quote from Newton that um, I'll put up at the end of my talk at the workshop, where he, he basically says, I don't know what other people think of me, but I think of myself as a little boy that uh, spent my life uh, on, the, on the seashore picking up a pretty pebble or a, a shell while the whole ocean of, of, of unexplored is beyond me. You know, it's just, just, just sitting there. And I, and, and I think that's the right attitude. It's, it's not the theory of everything. I don't have a theory of everything. We're, in science, we'll never get a theory of everything. We can't. We'll get a theory of everything except our assumptions. And those assumptions keep going down and down and down forever, Gödel tells us. So yeah, your theory of everything except your assumptions is, is basically a theory that barely scratches the surface. And, and so in that sense, it, it changes the whole dynamic. Right, right now, a lot of the dynamic is I'm this little tiny thing in this vast space and time. And I don't feel very significant, and the only way to get significance is to make my mark, so to make a new scientific theory, a new piece of art, or that piece of literature, the, the great American novel, finally the, the great American, whatever it might be. I'm trying to make myself significant or have some lasting value by something I do. But when you, and, and that puts a lot of pressure on you, you only got 60, 70, 80, maybe 90 years to do it. And um, you know, and then will they really look at your painting uh, 200 years from now? Who you know? Who knows? Will they? It, it's 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 you're really grasping at stuff to get significance for yourself. But and 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 it's sort of a struggle, right? So I'm doing all this stuff, or or I can just say, you know, screw it. I'm going to just drink and have a good time. And and, and but 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 and I'm not significant. I, I'm, I just acknowledge that I'm here to have a good time. So, but but when we let go of the physicalist framework, and we say, no, I am consciousness. I transcend this. Death is just stepping out of this headset. So that, that puts the, all that I'm doing in a very different framework. E so I feel the innate drive to try to be significant and to be better than the other. All that comp that's sort of wired into us, just like object permanence is wired into. So I see that's all. In other words, we're wired up to take the headset seriously. And, and so consciousness sort of wired itself up to take the headset seriously. But part of the waking up process is to step back and go, oh, wow, OK. Oh, no, 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 I'm not a little thing inside the headset. The headset is inside of me. I, I, I'm eventually going to take the headset off. So I can have a looser relationship with all this stuff. I don't need to get that big house to, to be something. I don't need to have that big scientific paper. I don't need to be acknowledged. I, I, this is just all. It's like, Has well, it done this for you, Donald? Has it done this for you, what you're now saying? Yeah, sort of this realization it's, in your personal life? It, it's interesting. It, it does it for me when I am conscious. When I let go of thought and sit there in conscious, consciousness without thought, yes. But as soon as I get back into thought, then I'm back into the, the old self that, that says, oh, that, that just, it's just, and by the way, it's, it's just, it's automatic. It's just like, yeah, the moon is there. Yeah, I need for my, you know, for my own significance to solve this problem or publish this paper. So, it, so I always have to step back and look at that and go, okay, there it is. And so part of it, so, but that, see, that may be part of the whole waking up process because when I step back and I go, okay, look, there it is. There, you know, it feels, it feels bad. I feel like I'm under pressure. Why am I under pressure? This is a game. Oh, I'm taking the game. So I got lost in the game again. Okay, so here, so here I am lost in the game. So, so that the periods of consciousness where you go, oh, look at that. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm competing with so-and-so. I feel mad, mad at so-and-so. Wait a minute. 
because Joe just told, stole my Ferrari and Grand Theft Auto. I mean, it's just it's just a game. Who cares if Joe stole my Ferrari <laughs> and Grand Theft Auto? Yeah, no, I absolutely uh, love yeah. it. Uh, but but it it's it's so beautiful because it, it this brings brings me back to discussions I have with Bernardo and Essentia. Of course, is that we want to communicate pure science, right? You don't want people to uh, uh, shift or accept an idealist worldview because they want meaning in their life, right? Like you would pick a religion because you want meaning. No, you wanna you want it because it's true because it's more truthful than uh, than physicalism. But you do get, as a sort of bonus, a lot of extra meaning, right? Because do you think culturally and where the world's at right now that this shift towards your view that consciousness is fundamental could also sort of bring us further and sort of make us tackle problems within the game that we are now sort of just, I'm talking climate, inequality, everything we see happening right now. What are your thoughts there? Yes, I, I, I think that this does lead to a perspective on social interactions and climate change and things like that. So communism, in principle, sounds like a great idea. No ownership, everybody works and shares. And if we were all wonderful consciousnesses, then that's, that's it, that, that, would be, that would be fine. But, but when we're plunged into this headset, it, it's competition. It's nature red in tooth and claw. That, that, and so communism doesn't work because we're all asleep. We all buy the headset. But if we wake each other up, if consciousness, so there are certain spiritual teachers, right, who are doing that, like uh, Eckhart Tolle, for example, and, and, and many others who, who are doing a great job of sort of helping to wake people up and say, you're not a little thing inside space and time. You are the fundamental consciousness. The only way for us to get social institutions that work better is for, for the people to change. R right now, we, we need the things like democracy, and, and maybe even blockchain because we don't trust each other, right? So what, what is the, what, why do we have democracy? Well, we, you know, if we have a monarch, we, we know that the monarch, it's luck of the draw. If it's uh, Nero, you're in trouble. If it's yeah. Marcus Aurelius, you're great, but, but that's very un unlikely you're gonna get a Marcus Aurelius. So, so when we have people that are asleep that believe that they're little items inside the headset, then we have to have all these rules in place and, and, and so forth. But as we wake up, then I think, and, and maybe hum, humanity will, go, maybe that's what consciousness is about in, in this headset, is, is humanity waking up. And uh, you know, maybe, maybe the science for the last several centuries, where it's studied space and time and, and, and all of a sudden realized space time is doomed, and my interpretation, we realized it's a headset. That was a huge part of this consciousness waking up. That space time is doomed as a big one. Now realize it's a headset, realize, oh, we're the consciousness beyond the headset. And then as we wake up, maybe um, we can have a different kind of interaction with each other inside the headset. Um, and so until there's the waking up, then we just have to use the standard, you know, rules and enforcement and democracy, avoid the monarch and all this stuff because any one person in power makes the whole thing vulnerable. That's, the, the blockchain takes it to the extreme where you basically, we make it, you'd have to have a, a third of the players, right, with the, that are trying to be negative or take things down for the thing to fall apart. With a monarchy, you just need one player to take it down. <laughs> but when you have blockchain, you need like a third of the players to be uh, malicious. You know, um, what they do, what they call Byzantine attacks and so forth. So, so I, I think that changing human nature simply by waking us up to what we really are is is the way forward for for the social things. Otherwise, you, what we have to do is just make sure that we have the right rules and and yeah, governments. and and, and yeah. you do this, and I think that is sort of noble and and so important that it's done through mathematics and not sort of because we had spiritual and religious traditions doing this but we also see them falling back in that headset reality, right? And that's all about power and sort of control. 
uh, whereas at the core, some of them or many of them, I think, point to this. But it feels as if mathematics is maybe the most safe way to do this, to just don't make mistakes in doing so, in waking up, make, make sure we really wake up and not sort of fool ourselves. I, I think so. I think that the mathematics is a gift that it, it counteracts dogmatism, it counteracts fuzzy thinking, it counteracts being asleep in, in some sense. It, it, it really is a, a wonderful tool um, to wake us up. The, I think there's something really deep there. Mathematics and its relationship to consciousness, I, I feel like my insight into that is trivial. I, I, I just have a deep feeling that After the, decades my, my understanding is it. trivial. <laughs> but, but so but I say that, that math is the bones of consciousness, I mean, that's a metaphor, but I feel like, uh, you know, like Newton, I'm like a baby boy on the, the shore and the, there's something really deep out there. Um, and Donald, did you to, to close our interview, because we started with your upbringing, your dad being this uh, the fundamental uh, of minister in a, in, a, in a fundamental Protestant church. Did you ever, uh, is he still alive, uh, your father, or? He died five years ago. Ah, right. Sorry to hear that. But um, did you ever discuss your, your work and theory? Did you have discussions with him about this? And what, what, what did he think about what you did, your, your work? I, I did. And I think he had mixed feelings about it. I think that he still thought the Earth is 4,000 years old. But I think that he also liked that I was saying that consciousness is fundamental because he thought that that was true. Um, he, he, um, that, that, but he, he had a notion of, of, of God, you know, that's sort of separate from us in some sense. And, and the notion of, that I have is more that we are all one with whatever that one consciousness is. Um, and that may be what Christianity really means deep down when it says that we're all children of God, right? That that might be um, the, the, what, that, what that means. So uh, he, he had, I think, mixed feelings. He wanted me to pursue this because he liked that it was not physicalist. So he loved the, the mathematics and the science that was showing that, that um, space-time isn't fundamental. But, but and, I, and I learned not to work, argue with him about evolution of natural selection and the age of the Earth, because within the interface, saying it's, you know, when you take on the framework of the interface, it's just wrong to say it's 4,000 years old, right? It's just wrong. Now, if you, if you step outside the interface, then, then I can say the very notion of time itself is an illusion. It's an artifact of the projection into our headset. So there is a, a deep sense in which, yeah, it's not 4,000 years old, it's not a billion years old, you know, it's, 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 it, it, right. yeah, but, but, yeah, but within the interface, if you're playing within the interface, then you need to play, play fair within the interface. It's just not, it's not 4,000 years old. <laughs> funny. It's so funny because it really reminds, it, it's the, the sort of discussions I have with my dad. He really likes the fact that all of this is pointing to consciousness being primary. But the moment I start telling that we are all one or part of this one consciousness, I mean, I'm much into uh, Bernardo's thinking here as well, then uh, I'm losing him because he really wants this God creator sort of exactly what you're saying outside of A separation. Uh, creation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I agree. Now, I'll just say w one little thing, too, about the, the, the Eastern traditions that are more mystical, that what this can do is th they talk about language as pointers, that the, the, the word isn't it, and so forth. But what science can do is really up our game on pointers. It can really help us. It's, 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 no, it's nothing to boast about that we've used the same pointers for 3,000 years. So I'm using the same pointer that uh, you know, the Tao Te Ching used or something like that. that, that that's, there's nothing to boast about. What we would like are, as a way to get, surely if consciousness is infinitely deep, we don't want to be sticking with the same pointers all the time. We, we need deeper and new pointers. To, and that's where science and spirituality together, not antagonistically, but the insights of spirituality with the rigor of science together can evolve new pointers that, that help us to avoid one of the big problems of, of human nature, which is dogmatism, both among scientists and among spiritual people. I mean, spiritual people can be very, very dogmatic. But I know the truth. It's very, very nice to have the mathematical stuff to actually push you so that you, you know, 
we believe dogmatically space-time is fundamental. Our math said, no, 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 space-time, your, your best theory of space-time tells you that space-time is not fundamental. That's how we avoid dogmatism. We need to bring math into church. Um, yes, uh, yeah, That's my, I will go to those sermons. Those are sermons I will go to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donald. You have to leave. Thank you, uh, thanks. This is a lot of, it was a great pleasure. Thanks, thanks. Good to hear that. It's been a pleasure as well. Thanks so much.